The public received confirmation last month that the FBI has labeled Trump supporters as a distinct category of domestic extremist. While this formal step towards the criminalization of political opposition in the United States is horrifying, it shouldn't really come as a shock. The FBI and DOJ have spent the last few years repeating the lie that right-wing extremism is the most serious domestic threat to the nation. Federal law enforcement intentionally cooks their statistics on politically motivated domestic threats by excluding groups like BLM and Antifa from the category of left-wing violence, thereby removing the most egregious example of domestic terror in recent memory, the riots of 2020, from the data. It's clear that the left is accelerating their efforts to make organic right-wing political organization a criminal offense leading up to the presidential election of 2024, and this poses a serious threat to those who still operate under the assumption that they are protected by the First Amendment. Popular political organization is as fundamental to the American identity as rights get. From the Boston Massacre to the Sons of Liberty dumping tea in Boston Harbor, protests has been woven into the American identity from the beginning. American schools regularly praise civil rights or anti-war marches from the 1960s. Media depicts the leaders of these movements as national heroes that change the course of history. It's no wonder that conservatives who have routinely watched the left get their way after popular political action would seek to organize their own movements in response to a government that cares little about their concerns. When the right begins to organize, however, they quickly learn that there's a very dangerous set of forces arrayed against them, seeking to turn the smallest misstep into a legal disaster. After months of leftist rioting and looting, where government buildings were placed under siege and militant activists established autonomous zones, many Trump supporters were understandably confused about the rules surrounding popular political action. The vicious persecution of protesters involved in the events of January 6 quickly made it clear that the American judicial system had been bifurcated, one standard for friends of the regime and one standard for enemies. Even more disturbing than the politically motivated persecutions, however, were the number of federal agents or informants who were present in the crowd that day. It's still unclear just how many of the protesters were working with or for federal law enforcement, but it is clear that the number is high and some of those individuals played a key role in shaping the events that unfolded. Groups like the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, who have been identified as flashpoints by the Biden administration, appear to have been deeply infiltrated by the domestic security apparatus. FBI agents and informants have also played a prominent role in engineering other right-wing plots like the planned kidnapping of Governor Gretchen Whitmer. The regime is looking for a very particular type of domestic enemy that will justify the expansion of policing powers, and they're more than happy to manufacture them if necessary. Universities today aren't just neglecting real education, they're actively undermining it, and we can't let them get away with it. America was made for an educated and engaged citizenry. The Intercollegiate Studies Institute is here to help. ISI offers programs and opportunities for conservative students across the country. ISI understands that conservatives and right-of-center students feel isolated on college campuses and that you're often fighting for your own reputation, dignity, and future. Through ISI, you can learn about what Russell Kirk called the permanent things, the philosophical and political teachings that shaped and made Western civilization great. ISI offers many opportunities to jumpstart your career. They have fellowships at some of the nation's top conservative publications like National Review, The American Conservative, and The College Thinker. If you're a graduate student, ISI offers funding opportunities to sponsor the next great generation of college professors. Through ISI, you can work with conservative thinkers who are making a difference. Thinkers like Chris Rufo, who currently has an ISI researcher helping him with his book. But perhaps most importantly, ISI offers college students a community of people that can help them grow. If you're a college student, ISI can help you start a student organization or a student newspaper or meet other like-minded students at their various conferences and events. ISI is here to educate the next generation of great Americans. To learn more, go to ISI.org. That's ISI.org. While the January 6th protests have given the regime its most valuable pretext for ratcheting up persecution, federal law enforcement has often decided to intimidate political opponents with no real justification. The DOJ threatened parents who showed up to school board meetings to protest doctrines like critical race theory and trans ideology that were being forced onto their children by progressive activists masquerading as teachers. Dozens of parents have been investigated by the FBI for daring to challenge the government's victimization of their children. We also know that agents from multiple FBI field offices surveilled and investigated Catholics who attended the traditional Latin mass, singling them out as potential domestic extremists. When you can't attend a church service or disagree with a school board member without drawing the attention of the national police force, you don't live in a constitutional republic, you live in the total state. Now to be clear, the Biden administration is very unlikely to formally ban all opposing political parties in the United States. 
For all of their delusional ranting about the rise of Christian theocracy, most establishment Democrats understand that the Republican Party, as it's currently constituted, is a valuable asset to the regime. Let's be honest, the GOP are glorified losers, and they're comfortable with that role. Any political party that believes power is bad and it should never be used, even if you happen to accidentally win an election, is no threat to the ruling elite. Most Republican politicians will pretend to care about advancing the ball on one or two issues, but in reality, they're happy to collect their salaries, be honored at the local Rotary Club, and call it a day. The Republican Party is a safe place for marginalized middle Americans to park their political energy while being farmed for political donations and tax dollars. If a candidate like Donald Trump comes around threatening to provide real opposition, he can simply be slandered and indicted until the opposition party goes back to picking safe losers like Mitt Romney or Mike Pence. No reason to destroy a perfectly good pressure release valve. While many conservatives have been unsatisfied with this dynamic for a long time, Trump galvanized that feeling into a movement with real momentum. People can and should criticize Trump for his lack of personal discipline and inability to realize the type of change necessary. But the energy he captured was real and scared the establishment for a reason. The left called George W. Bush a war criminal and John McCain a baby killer, but they never tried to put either man in jail to keep them from running for president. Trump may have not been capable enough to pose a threat to the swamp, but the spirit he captured was one of real opposition, not the safe and controlled neoconservatism that has played Washington generals to the Democrats' Harlem Globetrotters for so long. That's why federal law enforcement has largely been focusing their efforts on parents, traditional Catholics, and meme makers. While the GOP squabbles over how much American taxpayer money to launder through foreign vassal states, real political discontent continues to grow in the organic communities that have been abandoned by our political elites. Every totalitarian government knows that in order to maintain control, they must keep the populace jumping at shadows, terrified to organize or to take action due to the high probability that agents of the state are working to criminalize their actions. This tactic is particularly effective in our current environment where Americans believe instinctually that they have the freedom to organize but are also aware that simply making a meme or standing in front of the wrong crowd can completely ruin their life. In politics, the organized activists always beat the disorganized masses, which is why preventing effective organization is the first priority of our aspiring total state. So how should those who recognize this fact organize if they know that the state is actively looking to manufacture scary political enemies that they can parade around to increase their power? The first step is to avoid giving the regime easy targets, but as we can see from their targeting of parents and churchgoers, the regime is happy to focus on groups that are usually seen as benign. The smartest move for most conservatives is to start local, securing control of sheriff's offices, county commissions, and school boards. Large national-level demonstrations are not likely to bring sweeping changes and are far more likely to become targets of subversion. Capturing regional political control is often a thankless task, but that kind of diligence can create a bulwark against a corrupt administration seeking to punish dissent. Thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and click like. If you haven't subscribed yet, now is a great time to do so. If you'd like to get these broadcasts as podcasts, make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the Orrin McIntyre Show on your favorite podcast platform. And I want to tell you guys a little bit about the Blazes video series, The Truth About January 6th. Harry Dunn is a United States Capitol Police officer who testified about January 6th to Congress and wrote a memoir. He painted himself as a heroic martyr who fought bravely against racism and insurrectionists, but he lied, and none of those events actually took place. In fact, he'd had mental health problems since adolescence, largely revolving around anger issues. Those anger issues are evident in his breakdown at the Capitol. He conveniently left out that part of the story. This second installment of the Blazes video series, The Truth About January 6th, uses open source videos of a number of Dunn's outbursts that have been released to the public through several trials of January 6th defendants. That's why they've made the changes to Blaze News that they have, so stories like this can see the light of day. If you aren't a Blaze News subscriber, you can go ahead and support the work for just $36 a year, and that ensures that they continue to put forward content like this. So go to theblaze.com slash subscribe now to read the story and subscribe today.